Good morning, church family here at Pleasant Hill. It is so good to worship with you today uh, in the Lord's house with the Lord's people. Welcome to Pleasant Hill Baptist Church. If you're new to Pleasant Hill, you should have received a program when you came into this place. And in that program, there's a little fold-out portion uh, that you can take off and you can fill out and put your information there uh, on that little portion and give us some information about you and where you are in life and Lord, you could put that into the offering box as you leave today. We'll have some information about you and how we can better get to know you and minister to you and your family and take that program with you. And it has a lot of news about what's going on here in the life of Pleasant Hill. If you're worshiping with us uh, by Facebook or by YouTube, uh, you see that number there on your screen. If you would, please uh, text us your name and your email, and we'll be sending you something also so we'll have... Uh, give you some more information about our church and how God is working in and through uh, this church here at Pleasant Hill. If you will, please allow me to pray for us now as we join our time of worship together. Dear Heavenly Father, how awesome it is to be in your house with your people. Lord, to worship you in spirit and in truth. God, we give this service to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. Let's stand together as we sing. childhood. It reminds me of just some really special days. You know, uh, y'all are living in the best time of your life, whether you realize it or not. Y'all are. It is a really cool time in life. Well, I got a question for you this morning. Does anyone know what our pastor has been doing for the last few days? Anybody know? Anybody want to take a guess? Vacation? He has been on vacation. He has been on vacation. He's been taking a break. And I'm going to tell you, uh, everybody needs to take a break. Uh, it's very healthy to take a break in life. You know, uh, in just about a month, for those of you that are in school, uh, you're going to go back to school in August. And did you know throughout your yearly school calendar, uh, they have planned breaks in your calendar. Does anybody know what some of those breaks are called? Somebody raise your hand and tell me what they're called. Thanksgiving break, Christmas break, and 
Yeah, he, he just about nailed them all. Yeah, Thanksgiving break, Christmas break. Yeah. Oh, and there's a three-day break in one week. Or yeah, there is, a, there is a fall break. And also there's all other kind of little holidays uh, kind of spread out through there. You know, they do that to give you a break from learning and from your mind growing and expanding. And they do that on purpose. And, you know, I'm, you know, I'm thinking with all the other adults in the sanctuary right now, I'm thinking that I wish I could go back to be one of them so I could have a lot more breaks in, in my schedule. Uh, you know, taking breaks are good. They're healthy to take breaks. It's not good to just work all the time. And, you know, even in Scripture, you know, Jesus took breaks. Uh, several times in the New Testament, there's breaks that Jesus took. And one of my favorites is in Mark chapter 4, uh, verses 35 through 40. Uh, Jesus was going about uh, the countryside and ministering to people. He was doing everything that he normally did. He was healing the blind. He was healing the, the deaf and making the lame to walk. He was rising. He was bringing people back from the dead. He was teaching. Uh, and at the end of the day, he told his disciples, and I'm just going to paraphrase his story. He, he told his disciples, he said, let's get into the boat and let's go out on the lake and go to the other side. And so he planned that break. He planned to get in the boat with his disciples and go to the other side. You know what he did when he got in the boat? Anybody remember what he did? He, act, he didn't fall asleep. He went to sleep. He, he planned it out. He went down to the stern of the boat and he went to sleep. Well, in the middle of the night, a storm came up. A storm blew up and it said that the waves were so large that they were actually going over the top of the boat and the disciples thought they were going to drown. And so they went and they shook Jesus. And they shook him and they woke him up and said, Master, do you not care that we're about to drown? And Jesus woke up and he got up from the stern of the boat and he went out and he, he told the waves, he said, he told the waves to peace, be still. And he said immediately the waves and the water were all calm. Now it doesn't say what Jesus did next, but you know what I think he did? I can't prove this, but I think he went back to sleep. I think he went back to the bottom of the boat went back to sleep because, see, he was, he was taking some intentional time to rest because, see, Jesus is God, and Jesus is also human. And so he took on our human body as we are as people, so he knew he needed rest because he was thinking about all the work that he had to do. So he planned to break in there. And so we have to be careful as, as people that we don't get so busy that we totally miss what Jesus wants us to do. And we have to plan intentional breaks because a lot of times we get so busy with life that we miss what God wants us to do and we miss how, what God has created us for. And so I want to encourage you, uh, just like your parents uh, uh, schedule a doctor's appointment to go get a checkup or schedule you a dentist appointment to go get your teeth cleaned, just like they schedule appointments as adults in this building today, uh, we need to schedule time for ourselves. Maybe we just need to schedule some time just to read our favorite book. Maybe we need to schedule some time just to lay on our floor and stare at the ceiling just to kind of remain sane. Maybe we need to schedule some time uh, just to uh, be together as a family and soak in our, our, our fellowship. Uh, we need to make sure that we schedule that time in. And as we schedule that time in, we need to evaluate uh, where we are in life. You know, we need to make sure that we're really connected in several places. Number one, quickly, uh, we need to make sure we're connected through God's Word and connected to Him through His Word and through prayer. Because I've learned that the more Jesus you have, the more peace you have. The more Jesus you have, the more love you have. The more Jesus you have, the more patience you have. The more Jesus you have, you're just, a, just usually just a better person to be around. So we need to make sure we're connected through, to Jesus through his word and through prayer. Second, we need to make sure we're connected to our family and our friends that care about us and our church family. You know, one of my favorite parts of the week is coming to Pleasant Hill and being with my church family. And another really favorite time of my day is every day as a family, we try to plan to have one meal together, uh, usually at supper time, as we call it in the South, at supper time, and we plan a meal, and we either watch an Andy Griffin or a Leave it to Beaver while we're, while we're eating supper. And I just love it. We're just hanging out together as a family, just laughing and having a good time. But finally, we need to make sure that we're connected to ourself and make sure we're planning breaks in for ourselves. Because here's the thing, guys. The world needs you to be who God created you to be. Your family and your friends need you to be who God created you to be. And so if you're going to be who God created you to be, you need to make sure and take some breaks, just like Jesus did, just like our pastor is taking a break right now to unplug from the daily stresses of ministry. He's unplugged so he can refocus 
and, and, and make sure that he's where he needs to be in his walk with God and, 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 and leading this church. So make sure and plan in those breaks. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for these beautiful children that I'm surrounded with right now. God, I pray that if there's one of these here this morning that doesn't know you as Lord and Savior, they would make that decision to follow you with all their heart. And God, as they follow you, Lord, help them to look to you uh, for their health and their strength, both physically, mentally, and spiritually. And God, help them to be plugged into you always. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together as we continue to worship.
It is so good to be back with you. I have missed you over the, the uh, COVID intermission, uh, intrusion, break, whatever you want to call it. I have missed you, but I have really been looking forward to being with you today. And I'm, I'm glad, David, that, that Bill is on vacation, not only because he works really hard and and needs a break, Uh, and I appreciate not only what he does for you, but what he does for us, serving in leadership in our association, but because Bill is on break, that means that I have a chance to be here and to be with you, so that's good. It's always good to be at Pleasant Hill, and uh, you know, I, I do have a question for you this morning. As you go to Matthew chapter 5, verse 3, I'll give you a heads up, that's where we're going to be. But I I do have a question for you. What was or has been is the happiest moment of your life? Or if it's hard to pin down, what were the happiest moments in your life? Are they easy to pick out? Can you think of some pretty quickly? What are the happiest moments in your life? I was thinking about that question for myself, too, because, you know, I thought, if I'm going to ask folks this question, I ought to have an answer ready, and I I honestly had not given it much thought. You think about saying, well, the day that you get married, and that 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 was a happy day, the day your kids were born, but, you know, everybody says those things. I do remember, though, July 3rd, 2003, and I'm not saying the day that my kids were born or anything like that, that everybody says, but I do remember that was the day we took my son home from the hospital. We had our daughter and our son, and, you know, the family was complete, and I remember looking over at my wife and saying, you know, this is what I've been waiting for my whole life, but I'm not going to give those answers because those are the expected answers. And I I wanted to try to reach down and get something, you know, some moments that I really genuinely remembered being happy. Not too long ago, my family took a vacation out west, and it was my whole family, my mom, my sister and her family, me, my wife, our family, we all went out west, and I'd been really looking forward to that. I grew up watching westerns and dreaming about being a cowboy. Always wanted to be a cowboy, stare somebody down at high noon on a dirt street and win. I wanted to win. I didn't want to be on the losing end of that, but I'd I'd always thought about that. And part of that vacation, we went horseback riding. I've ridden horses in Mississippi. I grew up riding horses. That wasn't the big thing, but I got to ride a horse on a ridge in Wyoming to a place called Eagle Rock. Boy, how cool is that? Suddenly I was in the middle of every western I had ever watched. I'm not saying I felt like John Wayne, but it was pretty close. And I think about October 1st, 1992, I was a freshman at Mississippi State, and we were playing number 13, University of Florida in football, and we beat them 30 to 6. We were up in the student section doing the gator chomp and singing, Hey, baby, I just want to know if you'd be my girl. We were so happy, almost giddy that night that we beat Florida at Scott Field. It was wonderful. And I remember 
in October, another October day in 2007, I'd led my first international mission team and we got together in Thailand, northern Thailand in Pra, a city called Pra, and we had a meal together after the work was done and right before we came back home and we were just laughing and happy and I remember looking around at that group of saints that I had worked with and traveled with and had fretted over. And I remember thinking, this has got to be what heaven is like when your work is done and you can just sit back and enjoy with the people of God. Those are some of the happiest moments in my life. Jesus, in Matthew 5, 3, before I get too far, just want to say, he's, he's talking about happiness. Now this is near the beginning of Jesus' ministry. The crowds are flocking to Him. And He is, in effect, at this point in His ministry, we would say, a superstar. He was getting lots of attention and most of it was good. Everybody wanted to be with Him. Everybody wanted to be His friend. And this is, of course, before they were calling out for His death on the cross. But everybody wanted to be near Jesus at this point in his ministry. And at the beginning of chapter 5, it says that he looked up and he saw the crowds following him and he climbed the mountain and the disciples came and he began to teach them. This was probably a large crowd of disciples. Think more than just the twelve apostles here. This would be a large group. And he took that opportunity to teach his disciples about the kingdom of God. And this is his first full recorded sermon. So this Sermon on the Mount would set the tone for Jesus' entire ministry. And He doesn't begin His ministry by preaching commandments. He begins it by preaching happiness and blessedness. Let's stop here and just read what Jesus says in Matthew 5, 3. The beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, He says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Can we pray just a moment? Lord God, we love you. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for the way that he lived, for the death that he died, and for the life that he has now forever. But Lord, uh, I thank you also for what he taught specifically. I thank you for Matthew 5, 3, this part of the Sermon on the Mount. I pray that you would open it up to us. Lord, that you would open us up to it. And Father, that you would use the scripture to challenge us. Thank you for hearing our prayers. Thank you for loving us. In faith I receive the anointing of your Holy Spirit that I might preach this the way that I should. That Christ would be glorified and you, Father, in him. In Jesus' name, amen. So Jesus begins this message with the word blessed. And in the original Greek, that would be the word makarios, which means happy, fortunate, content, satisfied. It's the very first word of Jesus' full first full recorded sermon. Happy. Happy are those who... Content, satisfied are those who. And if this is the first word of the first full sermon that we have recorded in Scripture, then you could expect blessedness or happiness to be important to God. Now God is happy. I know there are Scriptures that say that God is indignant every day. He's in, he's, he feels this wrath towards sin. But there are many scriptures also that talk about God being happy and blessed. God is blessed. His people are blessed. We see in various parts of the scripture. So it's important to ask yourself, do you consider yourself to be blessed? Do you consider yourself to be happy? And I ask that. Because many people are not. I love to read biographies of Christians who have gone before us. I like to watch westerns and read Christian biographies, and that pretty much sums me up. 
not a whole lot here. But I've been amazed over the years as I've read through some of the biographies of great Christians, pastors, missionaries, church leaders, who struggled, I mean struggled with depression. Charles Spurgeon famously struggled with depression, and as a matter of fact, he dedicated an entire chapter in his book, Lectures to My Students. He dedicated an entire chapter to struggling with depression. It's also widespread in our population today, depression is. Uh, last week, I was at college orientation with my with my son, our baby is starting college in the fall, which also makes me pretty happy because I told him when he was graduating high school, son, I feel like I'm graduating too. But while we were at orientation, the dean of students was talking with parents about this generation that's entering college now, Generation Z, and he said, and I've read it in other places too, he said that this generation is the most depressed generation in American history. That, whether that's because there's something special about this generation or, or we didn't have good records or even talk about it in previous generations very much, I don't know. We won't get into the reasons for that now. But this generation is recognized as the most depressed generation in U.S. history. And I've also seen reports that 20% of people in marriages that make it, 20 per, only 20% of those are happy. Now, I'm happy, I'm scared to ask my wife if she is. But in this day and time, we find that we are wealthier than we've ever been, we have more than we've ever had, but we are not happy. And so when I ask you today if you're happy, it's an honest question, and it's a fair question you should ask yourself. God's design for you is happiness. And that, that's really part of the, the children's sermon that, that David gave this morning. Taking time out so that you can be happy with God, you can be happy with yourself. God designed you to be happy. He wants it. In fact, He commanded in Philippians chapter 4, verse 4, He says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. He wants His people to be joyful people. If God's people aren't joyful, what does it say about life in the presence of God? His people should be the happiest people on the face of the earth. But we don't take that seriously. And we settle for less. But it's not just anybody that receives blessedness. Jesus is very specific about who receives blessedness. He said, blessed are the poor in spirit. In Luke chapter 6 verse 20 is Luke's version of that teaching. And Luke just says, blessed are the poor. But Matthew goes a little bit further. He says, blessed are the poor in spirit. There are three Greek words for poor in the New Testament. Two of those Greek words simply imply a hand-to-mouth existence. And, and many of us know something about that. We live paycheck to paycheck in this day and time. A lot of people do. But the word that Jesus used for poor in Matthew 5, 3 is not talking about a hand-to-mouth existence. The word for poor in Matthew 5, 3 is tokos. You say it with me, tokos. Jesus is talking about abject poverty here. Jesus is talking about being so poor that you don't have any... You don't have any education, you don't have any abilities, you don't have any marketable skills in order to get money. You cannot live paycheck to paycheck because you have no ability to earn a paycheck in the first place. And literally, the word 
tokos means to crouch or to cringe, and it's, it's giving us the impression of somebody who is so poor, all they can do is hold out a hand and cringe away at the same time. It means to crouch or cringe. They can only beg and then shrink away as they beg for fear that the person who's coming to give them money might also be coming to give them a beating. They've been so poor and so abused their entire life. They have no hope unless somebody has mercy on them. It's the same word that Jesus used to describe the beggar in Luke chapter 16. You remember the story about the beggar and the rich man where the rich man went to hell and the beggar went to heaven? When he talked about the beggar, he used the word tokos. That beggar who just laid outside of the rich man's house every day and the dogs would come and lick his sores. That is a picture of this word for poverty. And Jesus said that becoming tokos, or tokos in spirit, is the beginning of happiness. And John MacArthur notes that this is the opposite of the world's view of happiness. And he's exactly right. Because the world would say, if you want to be happy, don't be tokos. If you want to be happy, you need to study hard, you need to work hard, you need to apply yourself and get a few lucky breaks and make it big and then lord it over other people. If you want to be happy, that's happiness according to the world. But Jesus says, happiness begins with being broken and poor because they have nothing to commend themselves to God. Like the beggar, they don't have anything to merit salvation or entry into the kingdom. But God gives the poor in spirit entry into the kingdom, and so that's why they're happy. They have nothing. They have no way of gaining access to anything, especially the kingdom of God, but God gives them everything. Now, in reality, every one of us, spiritually speaking, are tokos. Nobody has anything to commend himself or herself to God. Nobody can say, oh yeah, there's a little bit of good in me that God would find attractive or redeeming. There's nothing in us like that. And if you think that you have something like that in your life, you're kidding yourself or lying to yourself. One of the two. completely wretched before God. If there was anything good in us, then we could do something for ourselves. But the Bible says we can't do anything for ourselves, and that's why Jesus had to come and die for us. Because there was nothing that we could do for ourselves. So in reality, every one of us are tokos in spirit. But not everybody realizes that. And Jesus is talking about those who are poor in spirit and realize it. You are happy, you are blessed when you realize just how spiritually poor you are. Because when you realize how spiritually poor you are, then in humility you come to God on the merits of Jesus Christ. Not your own merit, because you realize you have none, but you come to God on the merit of Jesus Christ, and when you come to Him on the merit of Jesus Christ, begging for mercy, because there is nothing in you that would give God a reason to let you in on your own. You come to God that way. Then He gives you the kingdom of heaven. And when He gives you the kingdom of heaven, man, then you're happy. Then you're blessed. You say, well, how can I be happy? That's the question. You need to define happiness. Jesus is talking about an inner happiness, a happiness that is not dependent on circumstances in your life. It's not dependent on how you feel in the morning. It doesn't depend on 
uh, what people around you are doing. This kind of happiness is not ruined by frowns or bad news or by the jerk that cuts you off on the highway, your way to church this morning. The kind of happiness that Jesus is talking about can't be ruined by other people. It's like John 4, 14, where Jesus says, Whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never thirst, but the water that I will give him will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. That no matter what people around you are doing, no matter how bad life gets, you have this well of the water of life springing up within you and it just flows out and it comes out no matter how many times people try to plug it up. That's the kind of happiness that Jesus is talking about. And if you want to be that kind of happy, then you need to get into the kingdom of happiness. There's no other way. If you want to be, a, if you want to be blessed, you need to be a child of the blessed one. That's why the tokos and spirit are happy, because the kingdom of happiness belongs to them. And how do you get into the kingdom of happiness? By reciting a prayer? By getting baptized, shaking a preacher's hand? Coming to church, tithing? All of those things are good things. I'm telling you, you can only enter into the kingdom of happiness by faith. It's a transaction that happens in your heart, in your spirit, between you and God. And you can say all the right words and do all the right things, but unless you know the right one, all that other is just disappointment. Because it's never going to be what you think it ought to be. God's not interested as much in what you do as in who you are. He wants you to abandon everything for Him. It's like the story that Jesus told in Matthew 13, verse 44, about the man who was out walking in a field one day. And as he was walking in this field, he found a hidden treasure. And so when he found the treasure, he went away and sold everything that he had with great joy and went and bought that field because when he bought the field, he was going to get the hidden treasure. He found the treasure, went and sold everything that he had. His house, the furniture, the clothes in his closet, his transportation, everything. He sold everything with great joy. He got rid of it joyfully so he could acquire that treasure that he found. He became poor so he could become rich. It's kind of like the opposite of the rich young ruler who came to Jesus and said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus told him throughout that process, he finally came down to this, Jesus told him, said, go and sell everything that you have, give the proceeds to the poor, and then come follow me. Jesus was telling him to get rid of everything to become poor so he could become rich. The rich young ruler wouldn't do that because his sights were set on the things of the world. He wasn't poor in spirit. He was puffed up by the world's wealth. If you want to enter into the kingdom of happiness, then recognize your abject poverty before God, repudiate it, and rush into the kingdom. Because as long as you're satisfied by things other than the kingdom of God, you'll never abandon them. That's why the Tokas get into the kingdom so easily. They have nothing. They know they have nothing. And so when the narrow gates of the kingdom swing open for them, they rush in. Remember Jesus said it's Easier for a camel to go through the eye of the needle than it is for the rich man to enter the kingdom of God. But blessed are the poor in spirit, on the other hand, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And you say, well, that's all fine and good, but I believe in Jesus, I belong to Jesus, I know that I'm saved, I know that I know that I know that I'm saved. I've been saved for years, maybe decades, 
but I'm not happy. So don't stand up there and tell me that getting into the kingdom will make you happy. I've been there. That's a real problem. And here's what I would say to you. There's, there's one of three problems, or maybe all three problems are yours. If you know that you're saved, but you're not happy. First, it could be a problem of low expectations. It could have been all that you wanted whenever you came to Jesus was what Jesus could do for you in the hereafter and not the here and now. But remember in John chapter 10, Jesus says that the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I've come that they might have life and have it, what? More abundantly. If you're experiencing abundant life in Jesus, then you're going to be happy. So maybe your problem is low expectations. You're not thinking about the here and now. You're thinking only about the hereafter. Well, the hereafter is only part of what Jesus does for you. Maybe your problem is that you have lost focus. In other words, maybe you have forgotten that you were poor in spirit in the first place. Maybe you've been part of the kingdom so long, you've been part of your church so long, you've been active so long that you've started to think that everything rises and falls on you. And that if you suddenly were taken out of the picture, then the roof would cave in. It doesn't depend on you. And if the Lord tarries is coming, there is going to be a Christian church for centuries after you are dead and gone. It doesn't depend on you. God blessed you to bring, by bringing you into His kingdom. He had no reason that you could give Him to let you in. The only reason that He had for letting you in was in Him. So... You need to get over yourself and become amazed by God's mercy again. Or maybe your problem is that you're not investing in the kingdom. You only get out of it what you put into it, folks. Are you throwing yourself into the kingdom? Are you investing your time, your effort, your finances? Are you really investing in the kingdom of God? I think the more you invest in it, the greater return on the investment you'll see. But if you're not happy in the kingdom, you know you belong, but you're not happy, I would expect you've got one of those three problems. Either your expectations are too low, you've lost your focus, or you're not investing in the kingdom. You need to fix that. Ask God to forgive you. Repent and do what you should be doing by either having an accurate view of what life with God is like, an accurate view of yourself, or begin to invest. But if you don't know Jesus, if you're not a part of this happy kingdom of the blessed King, I want you to know that He's throwing the gates, those narrow gates of the kingdom, wide open for you. You come. He would receive you. Jesus said, All that the Father has given me will come to me, and he who comes to me I will certainly not cast them out. That means that even if everybody in your life has always rejected you, Jesus never will if you come to Him. And if you want to know more about Him, Brother Ricky, Brother David are going to be down here during the invitation. You come and ask them to tell you more about Jesus, and how you can know Him by faith. They'd be glad to tell you more about Jesus. If that matters, so would I. You just come. But don't leave here today unhappy in the kingdom. Let's pray together. Lord, we love you. Thank you for hearing our prayers. Thank you, Lord, that you are so good to us. Lord, would you forgive us for esteeming you, for esteeming your kingdom so lightly? And Lord, would you begin to work that miracle 
of your happy existence in us that we might be happy with you and give an accurate representation of you to the world. Lord, we love you. Thank you for hearing our prayers. In Jesus' name, amen. Without Him I could do nothing Without Him I surely fail Without Him I would be drifting Like a ship i